I recently read a story about these three guys that are uh, at the gym, and, and two of them start boasting. Out now, this wouldn't, ladies, this would never be your husbands, but two of them were boasting about how domineering and controlling, there's just all this massive control that they had over their wives, and after a while, they noticed that the third guy, he's not saying a word. He's not saying a word, and... Uh, and so they look at him. They look at him and say, well, what about you? How, how submissive is your wife? And the guy reluctantly says, well, well, just the other night, my, way, my wife came to me crawling on, my hand, on her hands and, uh, and knees. Well, her, <laughs> his friends get a little amazed. Uh, and they excitedly say, well, 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 what was she saying? What was she saying? And the man meekly replied, he says, get out from underneath that bed and fight like a man. <laughs> Get it on your knees, girl. Yeah. Doesn't exactly sound like a healthy biblical marriage, does it? Not at all. You know, biblical marriage and, and actually biblical relationship is based on submission. How many of you like that word, submission? You know, the, 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 how many of you just had a hair stand up on the back of your neck right now just hearing the word? But mutual submission to one another is, is, is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit working through us because we're submitted to Jesus. Because our Bibles tell us in Ephesians 5.21, it says, submitting to one another is unto the Lord. And, uh, and we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit tonight. God is, God is going to give us some, some specific details uh, on this topic. And, uh, and I titled it, I, not very creative, usually pretty creative, and uh, give some, some movie name or some rock and roll song that I used to bang my head to back in the day. Uh, in my, but uh, just love and marriage, and, and love and marriage. Not, not necessarily just love within the marriage, but love leading to marriage. And uh, the classic exhortation is there in Ephesians chapter 5. So turn your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5. Anybody doing their devotions in Ephesians lately? Anybody? Anybody? Just Melanie? Okay. Kate back there in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. What's she doing back there? Okay. All right. Context of, uh, of this entire chapter is, is Paul's challenge to all believers to walk in the what? Walk in the light. Is he is in the light and you have fellowship one with another, exactly. And uh, basically meaning to let our behavior be equivalent to our, to our professed belief system. And thus, it will reflect our love for Jesus. So there in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, look at, look at verse 1. Because usually when you talk, well, without looking in your Bible, let me see your eyes. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Everybody, okay. Where, where does the classic, what verses are the classic exhortation for marriage? Ephesians 5 what? Anybody? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Dave. Okay. That is a verse. And you know what that verse says, right? Husbands. And gave himself for her. Yeah, that you may. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I kept pointing. Uh, uh, and present her as a. Uh, Sacrifice, you know, holy and acceptable to, uh, to the Lord. Okay, anybody else? Somebody looked. I know. Just tell me. It's okay. It's all, here's the deal. It's always an open book test at Calvary Chapel, right? What verses usually? What are we, what are we talking about there? You guys are killing me. Verses 21 through what? What's the, what's the last verse of the chapter? Excellent. I knew that you'd get it. Very good. But even though we often, we often focus on those particular verses, Paul lays the foundation here in, uh, in verse 1. In verse 1, where he says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love 
as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. What Paul is saying here is that, that the proof of our love for God is going to be seen in the way that we walk in love towards those around us. You know, I, I tell you so often that, that, uh, that when people come here for the first time, they will often say, these people genuinely seem like they, like they care. They, you know, they'll, they'll even use the word loving. And so I go, well, like loving in like a creepy way <laughs> or in a, in a solid, genuine, genuine way, like a, like a cult kind of, oh, yeah, we love you. Or, or do you just see, a, we, we're just a genuine thankfulness that you're here and you're fellowshipping with us today, whether you choose to make Calvary Chapel your home church or not. You know, you're here for today, so we're going to love on you. And, uh, and that, no greater love as anyone than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. And, and uh, in, uh, I think it's First John, maybe it's Third John. Third John, I think, 4. Third John 4, it says, No greater joy as anyone than this, than uh, when you see your children walking in the Word or walking in the light. And, and so, so Paul, he's, he gives lots of commendations to this church in Ephesus because they really are. They're, they're walking in love. And, and with that, I want you to skip down to verse 15 because Paul is, Paul is going to use, uh, he's going to give us more encouragement on our walk with the Lord and our daily behavior and, and our everyday practice in the Lord and, uh, and what it should look like. So in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5, it says, See then that you walk, what? Circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I had, uh, had my carpets cleaned a while back, and you know that when you have your carpets cleaned, sometimes they'll, they'll put up these little signs up there that says caution and and uh, and slippery and they're just they just remind me that you need to walk circumspectly. Uh, how many of you have learned to do the shuffle in the snow or in an icy driveway? Yeah, yeah. You just do the you do the little bit of a shuffle so you're not taking big steps because you're walking circumspectly. Because if you don't, what happens? You bust your tailbone, right? Anybody ever fallen backwards? And that is not, that is not any fun. Walk circumspectly. It means to live your life with a specific purpose. And part of that purpose is constantly staying alert, looking for opportunities to be an ambassador for the Lord, knowing that uh, that's the Lord's will for our life. Walking circumspectly will include, look at verse 18, don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with uh, the Spirit. How many of you have ever seen somebody drunk? I mean, not tonight, right? Hopefully nobody here, right? Okay, okay. Someone drunk. So it's obvious uh, that a person is sometimes affectionately called under the, yeah, under the influence and in the same way, when, when someone is under the influence, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, it should be obvious to everybody. Do you know some people that you just enjoy being around because they're just beaming Jesus? They're always talking about Jesus. They're, it's the Word of God that is constantly coming out of their mouth. They're, they're constantly building you up. They're, they're constantly edifying you. And, and uh, if they have to, if they have to say something, you know, if they're not pleased with something, they, they use terms like, well, bless your heart, you know, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know what that is, you know, that's like mother code for like, you are dumb as a rock, <laughs> but, but you're, you're the dumb as a rock child the Lord gave you, and I'm going to love you anyway, and, and, uh, well, bless your heart, I mean, just, I wish I was that person. I, I, I probably don't always say, well, bless your heart. 
Look at verse 19. It says, uh, speaking. It says, speaking to one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is, verse 21. Is this underlined? Before I even say it, is it underlined in your Bibles? Is it underlined in your Bibles? Submitting to what? Say it with me. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Is that what you're known for? Not what you think you're known for. But is that what other people, is that what other people would say about you? Oh, that's a different story, huh? That's a different story. So what I want to remind you of, uh, being filled with the Spirit, it's not a title. It's not a one-time occurrence. It's a condition. Look at, uh, look at Paul's sentence structure here. He is, he is giving a continual imperative. Keep on, right? Remember that back? None of you. I wonder, is there anybody here that's as old as I am? Father, Father, time close. Remember that? Remember the keep on trucking, dude? Remember that guy? Remember the keep on trucking, dude? <coughs> keep on trucking. He's constantly, you guys are keep on trucking. What kind of stuff is that? <laughs> Just look up, uh, look up 70s drug dealer or something like that and, and keep on trucking and you'll, you'll get an idea. It's just a logo that people used back in the day. But keep on, keep on. That means keep on being filled. Something that we are seeking God for every day. Paul says if you're a spirit-filled person, your communication is going to be what? <coughs> edifying. Edifying. Your conversation. It's going to be edifying. Your countenance is constantly going to be pointing people to God. You know, there are some people out there. I go, oh, like, you're a Christian, right? You're a Christian, right? And they, go, yeah, I'm a they just never smile. I go, you're a Christian, right? And I go, yeah. And I go, well, does your face know? <laughs> does your face know that you're saved? Bro, you look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. Come on. You've got the spirit of the living God dwelling inside of you. How can you, how can you suppress the smile you have knowing that you've been forgiven of your sin, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Everybody's looking at me now with a smile on there. That's hilarious. But good for you. Good for you. That's the teachable part of fat, right? Yeah, it's, it's good. You will, you will find yourself. Who was I talking to the other day? I think I was talking to Kate the other day about just doing the Walmart test. And then she told me, well, I never go to Walmart. I go, well, go wherever you go, <laughs> wherever you go, go grocery shopping. My budget allows for, for Walmart, right? But just walk down the aisles of Walmart, make eye contact with somebody, and smile at them. Because it's, it's awkward for a second. They're going to go like, do I know? And then they go, oh, no, that person is just smiling. That person just has, yeah, that person just has joy. So, uh, so just try it. Just, and not a creepy weirdo, you know, kind of, yeah, yeah, not that, yeah. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's amazing because almost always, I would say 95% of the time, they, they will just smile back and and. People just realize that, that your countenance communicates. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if you've got, if you've got the joy of the Lord, where? Down in my heart. Where? Down, Down in my heart. Because <laughs> we're so very... <laughs> because, yeah. Okay, that's enough. Um, but, but the whole idea is that, that you have Jesus indwells you. Do you think that Jesus was frumpy? Do you think that Jesus didn't smile? I would say most of the time that, that he, I mean, he was relational and especially around kids. So just your, your countenance communicates a lot. The person filled with the Spirit has a very apparent attitude of gratitude, giving thanks. And, and Paul says the person filled with the Spirit has a gentle and a tender nature submitting to one another out of a fearful respect of the Lord. I can see those little bubbles that are over your head right there. You said, Greg, now you had me, had me talking about, you know, when we were talking about communication 
and the attitude of gratitude and the giving of thanks. But when you mentioned, when you mentioned the S word, the submission thing, I'm going to have to agree with Hall and Oates, right? I, I can't go for that, right? It's hard. Submission is not an easy word for people to get comfortable with. This is, uh, this is the first of several times today where, where I'm going to say, uh, I didn't write it. I didn't write it. God wrote it. I'm just repeating what God has said, so we, we should learn to like it. You know, I tell people all the time, you do what you want. You know, it's between you and, and God Almighty. But, but from the spiritual mandate we just read, if you're not submitted to others, you're not submitted to God's Word. And if you're not submitted to God's word, you're not submitted to God. And let me tell you, that is not a, it's not a wise place to be. Look there at verse 21 again. Paul drops one of the biggest bombs in all of his writings, and he, and he says that there, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Paul says that the only way that we're going to be able to do that is by being filled with the Spirit. Can't we agree that, that submission goes against our carnal nature, right? Because what goes with our carnal nature? Me, right? Yeah. Me, yeah, yeah. I don't want to submit to other people. I want other people to what? Submit to me. Yeah, it's all about, it's all about me. Yeah, well, it's not all about, it's not all about us. Carnal nature is what we're born with. It's a, it's a supernatural work when a man or woman chooses to lay down their pride and be other-centered, not self-centered. Babies, have you noticed this? I don't, I don't know. Maybe you moms have, haven't noticed this, but, uh, but babies are very self-centered. Have you, have, you, have you figured that one out? They're cute, right? Until they're not, right? I mean, they are. Babies are cute. They're cute most of the time. They smell cute. They, uh, can you smell cute? You know, they, uh, you get the idea. I mean, the babies are cute, but, but when a baby wants something, it's I want my food now, right? And you learn to distinguish the difference in the cries. You know, I want to be held now. I don't want to be held now. I want my diaper changed now. I want my bottle now. I don't know what I want, but I want something right now, and I'm going to cry and cry and cry until you as a mom figure out exactly it is what I want. You know, a baby isn't concerned about a mom's sleep or a dad's sleep. Mommy needs some mommy time. Well, inside, that little baby is saying, too baddie waddy, because I, I own you, right? <laughs> right, I own you. It's just like our pets sometimes. Like, if we owned our pets, they'd be cleaning up after us. Just goes to show that they, maybe they're smarter than we give them, we give them credit. We give them credit for, you know. Uh, they don't care about, babies don't care about how much things cost. Yeah, it's, it's, they have one thing on their mind. That one thing on their mind is me, me. You know, we expect that out of babies, right? But when full-grown adults in the church resort to that same attitude, don't esteem others better than themselves, that is biblical evidence that they are not submitted to the Holy Spirit. Uh, can't we all admit, we, we are all imperfect, imperfect vessels, or pots. We all have, we all leak, right? We all have some cracks. Thus, I think we all qualify as crack pots. Get it? Get it? Okay, <laughs> crack pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was always taught, since we are spiritual crack pots, stay under the spout, right? Stay under the spout where the spirit flows out. And as we pray continuously, you know, in our communion with Jesus, ask him, ask him to pour out his spirit upon you. That's the only way that we're going to have a, and live a victorious life. Paul has said here that being filled with the Spirit is something you have to seek how often? Continuously, right? It's got to be continuously. Remember, being filled with the Spirit is not a singular occurrence. I, I am constantly encouraging you, encouraging everybody, not just our church. What is missing from the contemporary Christian church today is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, 
Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. You want to know why you don't have a passion for evangelism? You don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm encouraging you, seek him for it. How much more will your Father in heaven, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask for the Holy Spirit? So I, I'm just telling you, once, once you... I, th I think much of the church... I was talking to another pastor, uh, another Calvary guy the other day, and there was a time that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was taught a lot within Calvary's. And now it's not really taught a lot anywhere, except in some hyper-Pentecostal churches, and they have a tendency to exploit what the baptism of the Holy Spirit really is. You know, they often turn it into something that's all about tongue swaggling, which, if you have the gift of tongues, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's supposed to edify you and your relationship with the Lord. But when people think that that makes them more spiritual just because they have the gift of tongues, or because they fake they fake the gift of tongues. Um, it shows immaturity, not, not maturity. And if you have the gift of tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 gives us line by line, we'll get it there on our Sunday morning study, exactly how it is supposed to be used within a, uh, a, church, within a church setting. But the key to being filled with the Spirit is to be emptied of your... Oh, that would be something... Somebody could, like, post that right now, right? That'd be good. The key to being filled with the Spirit is to be emptied of yourself. Anybody writing that down? Anybody? 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 You're going to post it on your Facebook page, your Instagram, your Twitter account, social media platform choice. I got nothing against <coughs> social media platforms. I think what the enemy intended for evil, the Lord can turn for good. You know, you don't, you don't have to make... Uh, your social media, the time pit that sometimes we can allow it to be. But use it for spreading the gospel. The enemy's all over the internet. Why aren't we? Right? Why isn't the Christian church? So, so use it. Post that kind of stuff all the time. The best way, the best way to be filled with the Spirit is to be emptied of ourself. And that involves true humility, which leads to this next passage that... Uh, that uh, Paul is going to discuss uh, this topic of, of humility and submission and dying to self within the covenant of marriage. Now, we're going to read uh, this section all, uh, I think I'm going to do it all in one clip. might go back and hit a couple of these over again, but I want you to get an overview of what's going on, and I want you to, I want you to read it in the context of how Paul opens this chapter, right? Be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. And then he has said that we're to walk what? Circum, circumspectly. And then we get to this portion in, uh, in verse 21. Verse 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay? Again, I didn't write it. I'm just repeating it. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is what? Subject to Christ, so that wives be to their own husbands and everything. Ladies, you have my permission to, to, to just out loud proclaim, say what? <laughs> say what? Well, I, yeah, I know, I know. Well, I, I just found out who's sleeping in the garage tonight, right? <laughs> Yeah, Valentine's Day. <laughs> God did write it. God did write it. It's just not an easy... Ladies, isn't that true? It's not an easy pill to swallow, right? But when you're in subjection to the Holy Spirit, it will get easier. And trust me, men, you have the much larger charge than the gal does. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that wives be to their own husbands in, <laughs> I can pretty much guarantee, well, this, here's survey time. Ladies, how many of you have that word everything circled? I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine any, right? I would, if I was a lady, I would have a very difficult time circling that. Yeah. Uh, let the record show. <laughs> Not one. 
Not one. I don't blame you. Maybe you have that whole line, but not that circle to everything. Husbands, here you go. Ladies, you can breathe. Uh, you can exhale now. Ladies, here we go. Husbands. Husbands, do I have your attention? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Men, how did Jesus give himself for you. He died. He laid down his life. That's what Paul is communicating here. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. You could probably write in the column of your Bible right there, happy wife, happy life, right? Yeah, you could probably put that right there. <laughs> For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nurtures, nurtures and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become what? What's that say? One. Anybody got that word circled? You guys are killing me. You better circle it now, right? If you're married. Yeah. Or you're ever going to be married. Yeah, one, right? One flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. See, that's the key to this whole passage. Very often people will conclude that this is, oh, yeah, that's the marriage chapter. No. Well, could be, yes. Marriage to who? We are the bride of Christ. Yeah. Your maker is your husband. Isaiah 54? 5? Something like that. Somebody fact check me on that. I think it's Isaiah 54, 5. Something. Your, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she what? Respects her husband. Okay, anybody had that circled? Okay. One person. Good. Now, in those 13 verses, Paul has said a mouthful, and I could spend weeks breaking that down, yet yeah, just for tonight, I just want to focus on the portions that pertain to marriage. Turn your Bibles to uh, Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. Kicking it old school, right? Yeah, going back. Genesis 2. Look at verse 18. It says, And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So after creating Adam and watching uh, him for a while, God said, This is God. <laughs> This guy's going to need some help, right? <laughs> this guy's going to need some help. And 6,000 or so years later, not much has changed. Look at verse 19. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he should call him. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. But for Adam, that was not found a helper comparable to him. So after a long day of, uh, of Adam naming the birds and the fish and the animals, there still isn't a comparable helper for Adam. And even though God is, uh, is setting up a, a pattern, you know, hopefully that Adam is going to get, you know, he, he had seen Mr. and Mrs. Monkey, right? He had seen Mr. and Mrs. Tiger, he had seen Mr. and Mrs. Eagle, but there's no Mrs. what? There's no Mrs. Adam. And apparently God had to... Uh, knock Adam out to provide for him. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. Uh, for the single guys, for the single guys that are out there, quick nugget. Uh, I see single guys, even single young ladies, and they get tired of the, of the, of the dating process and the dating drama that goes with it. You know, sometimes it's just best for single guys to let uh, God do with them what God did with Adam. And 
put you in a metaphorical deep sleep and let God bring you your Eve instead of chasing after all the wrong ones. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I think, uh, I think we see a lot less broken hearts. You know, guys get broken hearts too. You realize that? Guys get broken hearts too, just like, uh, just like young ladies do. And, and like I said on Sunday, if you single people think that you have found Mr. Right or Miss Right, yeah, let me take them out to lunch. Let me have them for an hour, and I will ask them all the questions that you don't want to ask because you don't want to know. And I will, I will spare you a lot of time in helping you come to the conclusion that, well, maybe, maybe this isn't going to be a good fit after all. Look at verse 21 again. The Lord uh, God caused a deep sleep to fall, to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one, uh, one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to, uh, to the man. And Adam said, wowza. Is that, what he, is that what your Bible says? You say, wowza. That's the original translation, <laughs> right? Actually, yeah, actually, yeah, actually in the Hebrew, it, it says, it said, wowza, she ain't no monkey, <laughs> right? You know, you, you've never, now look it up. I read it, uh, I read it uh, in the internet, I don't know, somewhere. Oh, it says, this is now, <laughs> wowza, she ain't no monkey, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, that's funny, right? Uh, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, some people have speculated God's reasons for creating Eve. Some have said uh, Adam might have got lost in the garden constantly <laughs> without a wife, you know, who is smart enough to ask for directions. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, some have thought that Adam would starve without a wonderful wife to be able to cook him some, some tasty grub, right? Some have uh, said that uh, after God created Adam, he just stood back, scratched his head, and said, I can do better than that. Yeah? <laughs> I'm going to get lynched by everybody, you know. Uh, I'm just an equal opportunity humbler. You know, for, 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 that's my gift. Yeah, that's, my, that's one of my gifts, yeah. You know, I'm not sure I'd agree with all those speculations, but uh, I do know this. In Genesis uh, 2, 18, it says, The Lord God said, it's not good. It's not good for man to what? It's not, it's not good for man to be alone. Let me see if I can get there. Let's do that. Yeah, not good for man to be alone. Then, uh, then turn there. I want you to know that. Go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. Look at verse 22. Tell me when you're there. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Proverbs 18, 22. Read it with me. What's it say? He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. That's what God says about why he provided Adam with Eve. Ladies, um, please, please, please don't miss this. We read in our Bibles that God formed all the animals out of what? The dust of the, yeah, the dust of the earth or the dust of the ground. But you, ladies, God formed from a rib, a part of the body that protects a man's heart. Have you ever thought about that? And believe me, ladies, you have you have the power to protect your man's heart or you have the power to hurt your man's heart cause him pain ladies you know this your your man your man is not anywhere near as tough as uh, he may portray himself to be you know that next to god your husband chooses you to be the second greatest influence in his life and he is he is vulnerable, ladies. He is vulnerable to your speech. He is vulnerable to your tongue. Um, and because you're so close to his heart, you have, you have a lot of power with a discouraging comment. And, and uh, it can crush your husband's spirit. 
So, so my encouragement is understand that. Understand the power that God has given you and build them up. Build them up. And the same thing goes for you, for you men. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And in Proverbs 18 also, it, it tells us that life and death, powers it's found in our tongues so so just from what i've heard uh in marriage there are times when it's you you it, it let's just call it married couples can have times of intense fellowship let's just call it you know you're not agreeing you know there's there's something going down and you we all have said things in the past that we've we we shouldn't have ever said and we'd like to take it back. So I'm just encouraging you, knowing how close, and, and, and it's equal, you are equally close to one another's hearts. If you, you know, there's a reason why Proverbs tells us to set a guard over our mouths. If you feel like you're going to say something that you know isn't going to be edifying to one another, just take 10 minutes and go and pray. Go to your separate quarters, I get it. Whatever it means, just go to your separate, you know, place of the house. Just maybe even just go back to back, you know, and just talk to the Lord. And I can guarantee you that He will soften your heart. And not that uh, not that your spouse might your spouse might be wrong, but the way that you tell him he's wrong, or the way that you tell her she's wrong, goes a long goes a long way. So um, unconditional love does that. It'll it. Just, just picture a little, a little police person, a little police man, a little police woman, you know, over your mouth, just holding a stop sign, you know, <laughs> holding, holding a stop sign. Stop in the name. Oh, I was just going to do it. I don't want to sing it because I want to keep you as my friends. All right, I'm going to move along here. Um, how many of you would like to have a great marriage? Okay. You all want to have a great marriage. It's a good thing. Um, pay attention to this next verse. Verse 24, Genesis chapter 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The inference is one flesh spiritually and one flesh physically when you come together in a romantic way. And so Adam, Adam wakes up out of his deep sleep, says, Wowza, come here, my little riblet, or... Something like it's out of the rib, right? Uh, give me my little riblet. There you go. That's so. Maybe it's not peaches or pudding or honey or or yeah. Give me my little riblet. Just make sure you say it with a smile, right? Say it with a sexy smile. Come here, my. Come here, my little riblet. Right? All right. I just embarrassed everybody in the room, including myself, and proceeds, <laughs> including myself. Yeah. And proceeds to tell her that she is the most beautiful woman in the world. You want to know why? Because she was. Yeah, she was the only woman in the world. But, uh, yeah. This is, I'm just stating facts here. That's what the Bible says. Husbands, never forget. Your wife must always be assured of that fact. That to you, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. And by keeping that practice, you're going to reap a great marriage. So that's how God started this marriage thing off. You know, a man and a woman created without a carnal nature, living in harmony with God and their surroundings. But, 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 guess what? In chapter 3, enter the dragon, right? Bruce Lee reference there. Enter the dragon who deceives Eve to break. How many, how many commandments did he give to them? How many? One. How many did they break? One. They're one for one. That's 100%. One commandment that God had given them. So, and since sin loves company, so she gets Adam to also eat from the tree of knowledge of both good and evil, and consequences were birthed, and this is what, uh, this is what God said. Chapter 3. Let me go there. Chapter 3. Verse uh, 16, said, To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Can any of you ladies say epidural? <laughs> yeah, epidural and pain, you will bring forth children. Apparently, it was God's intention 
that childbirthing was going to be a breeze, right? No C-sections, no epidural, you know, uh, no hospital bills, you know. So there's one consequence uh, from your Auntie Eve, and here's the second one. Your desire shall be for your husband. See, we're getting back to this submission thing. And he shall what? He shall rule over you. Again, I've asked it, ladies, how many of you have that circled in your Bibles? He shall rule over you. Again, I'm, I'm not anticipating too many. But you could. What would it say to God if you were willing to circle that right now? Hmm. That's began, right? You know, he shall rule over you. That's, that's when the battle of the sexes all began, and it wages today. Many have speculated that the original intent that man and woman were to co-rule the planet. But all that changed with Eve's disobedience. And as a result, I've heard some gals say that the first thing that they want to do when they get to heaven is walk up to Aunt Eve and punch her right in the schnoz, right? Because, uh, no, this, ladies, there will be no punching in heaven. Let me just remind you. <laughs> but what would it, what, how things would be different that had never taken place. So, God Almighty has just reproved Eve for listening to the serpent. Uh, but check it out in verse 17. He's going to get in Adam's grill here just a bit as well. Look at this, verse 17. Then Adam, God said, because you heeded the voice of your wife. Now, that is something, men, you should underline in your Bibles for obvious reasons. Because we're not the heed the voice of anyone but God. I, I have seen so much heartache when your wife can be a good counselor to you. Your husband can be a good counselor to you. But you never heed their voice over God's voice. And that's exactly what happened here. That's exactly what happened here. Adam chose to heed his wife's voice over his God's voice. It's never a good thing. Said, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you. A little reminder there, Adam, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Apparently, work and tending to the garden was going to be fun and easy, but now it's going to be what? It's going to be toil. It's going to be, it's going to be hardship. So after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, everything changed, and there hasn't been a marriage made in paradise ever since. So don't expect yours to be perfect all the time. So there's the gloomy truth of God's Word, but there's hope. There's hope in God's Word as well. And even though no marriage, like I said, is going to be perfect again, God has set up principles for harmony in the home, which leads us back to this S word. What's the word? Oh, it was submission. I want you to look at me and say the word submission with a smile. As hard as it's going to be. You don't want to say it, huh? Yeah, you don't want to say it. I know it's hard. Trust me. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But your life is going to get easier when you learn this principle. Learn and apply this principle. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. You have the knowledge. Prove that it's wisdom by actually applying it. Mutual submission to the roles God has presented in His Word. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the study, according to God's Word, submission is the basis for all interpersonal relationships. Submitting to what? Submitting to one another. Let's see, maybe let's go here. Yeah, submitting to one another in the fear or reverence of God. The playing field at the foot of the cross is level for all people in the body of Christ, including husbands and wives. And we're all responsible for the Lord, uh, responsible before the Lord to submit to each other. Now, I've had some people that just get so paranoid over this word submit. You know when you're filling out an online application and at the very end it has a button, what does it say? It says submit. I'm not doing it. I'm not pushing it, right? I will not submit. 
It's our carnal nature, right? It's our carnal nature that resists submission due to our pride. We, we don't like to submit to God's authority, and He's perfect. So it shouldn't surprise us when pride keeps us some, from submitting to others. Paul uh, uses this, this Greek word. It's a Greek word, uh, hypotasso. And it literally means to be in subjection. It means to obey, to be obedient, to put yourself under as a, as a, as a ranking. It's like a military term. It means to arrange in divisions under the command of a leader. And in non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in in response. Uh, it's a response of cooperation. Uh, it, it means that you're assuming responsibility and, uh, and, 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 and carrying a burden. That's, that, uh, God isn't... Have you, have you ever done a, a, uh, a word study on this word submission? I encourage you to do it. It'll help you out. It'll help you out. Because God isn't silent on this topic. And submitting to one another doesn't only apply to marriage. In this chapter and in the beginning of the, the, the next chapter in, in chapter 6 in Ephesians, this principle of submission, it, it, it's going to apply to six separate, count them, six separate categories. The body of Christ is to submit to what? One another. Okay? Husbands are supposed to, uh, well, it says wives, you know, uh, the body of Christ is supposed to submit to your wives to submit to their husbands, husbands submit to the Lord, children submit to your parent, slaves submit to your masters, and masters submit to God. And when we realize that this principle is for the good of the body of Christ, it becomes easier to let go of your pride, to let go of your ego, to let go of, of self, and submit your care to God's wisdom. Submit your care to God's wisdom. You're going to, I'm telling you, you're going to be a much happier saint when you are living in obedience to God's Word, recognizing that choosing to lay down your life for others is a response to recognizing the one who laid down his life for you. Changes everything. See, Ephesians 5 is, is, is often focused on the physical marriage, but you'll remember that Paul said in Ephesians 5, look at verse, look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at the person next to you and say, we are the bride of Christ. Just say to somebody right there, we are the bride of Christ. Well, thank you. I was waiting because nobody was saying it to me. You're showing some favoritism partiality there, but it is Valentine's Day, so well played. Well played, third wheel. <laughs> That's cold-blooded right there, but, but funny, but funny, right? You know, we're the bride, yeah, we're the bride of Christ. And, and uh, as we keep that at the forefront of our minds, God will bring the change in our lives. He's the one who changes us. We just have to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God's grace in our lives is a changing grace. And in honor of Valentine's Day, I'm going to wrap up uh, with a short story about a man named Valentine Burke. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Valentine Burke. Probably haven't. Anybody? No? 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 Here, I'll go. I'm going to Google him right now. See if Greg's just making this up. No such thing as Valentine Berg. Oh, yeah, you didn't Google hard enough. So uh, back in the late, te- late 1800s, I think I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, there was a, th- this, this master burglar, um, really bad guy. His name was Valentine Berg. Caused havoc. Lived in St. Louis. And, uh, and he gets caught. And while awaiting uh, in jail for his trial, he gets a copy. He gets a copy of a sermon from D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, guess what sermon? It's Acts 16, where he's talking about the Philippian jailer and where the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be, yeah, to be, to be saved? And... Uh, uh, Burke, uh, Burke said uh, this. He said, 20 years and more, I've been a burglar and I've been a jailbird, but I've never felt like this. What is it? What is it to be saved anyway? Because I've lived a dog's life and I'm getting tired of it. If there is such a God as that preacher is telling about, I want it. I want that. 
The guy repents of his sin. He seeks God's mercy, surrenders his life to Jesus, and the guy gets saved. Amazing, right? He does his jail time. He gets out, lives the straight and narrow Christian life, and eventually was asked by a police officer um, uh, to become a police officer. Here's like ripoff number one. He's, asked, he's invited to come on the police force. And he was even trusted to guard some very treasured jewels that were on display in St. Louis. And he was quoted as, as saying, look what the grace of God can do for a burglar. A once stealer of jewels is now allowed to guard them. You know, we all have a, a story like Valentine Burke to some extent. You know my story. It's probably worse than most of your stories. But, but look at what God can do. He uses the foolish of this, things of this world to confound, to confound the wise. And if you realize that, that the treasure that you carry with you every moment of every day in these, these earthen vessels, the mystery of God. Remember, he's talking about the mystery of God. Why would we not want to share that with everybody that we come in contact with? Why wouldn't we want to live it out so people would... Would, would say about us the same thing that Valentine Burke was, was saying about, about, about D.L. Moody. If, there, if there's a man that preaches this, and this is true, I want that. And I think more people would want it if we, if we just would, would just submit to the power of the Lord working, uh, working through this. Okay, so here are our discussion questions for, uh, for tonight. I think I put them up there. What did Paul mean in verse 1, be imitators of God? In verse uh, 17, how do we discern what the will of the Lord is? Number three, how do we stay under the spout where the Spirit flows out? Number four, why do we struggle uh, with submitting to one another as under the Lord? Number five, how do the previous four questions impact our marriage and relationships? Uh, number six, how do we keep Jesus as our first love? And the bonus question, number seven, do you think that Adam might have actually said, wowza, she ain't no monkey? That's just, a, I just love, that's funny to say. I, go ahead, say it once. Say it, wowza, she ain't no monkey. That's funny. Let's pray.